Szeretettel köszöntök mindenkit a Goethe Intézet mesterséges Welcome to Goethe Institute's series of panel discussions. This is the second event. You can watch the previous discussion on the website of Goethe Institute. And this event will focus on uh, the relationship of AI and ecology, but I think art will also touch upon because two of our participants uh, are committed to art. Let me introduce our speakers today. Georgi Galik, who is an innovation designer, an environmental and climate change strategist. And Julian Arborn is a research fellow. She writes her PhD thesis about AI and uh, art and aesthetics at the Faculty of Arts of uh, Otto von Goethe University in Magdeburg. And Agostin Nagy is an artist, research fellow, head of research at the Creative Technology Hub and Immersive Media Lab of Mohoy Nagy Arts University. And Agostin is also the godfather or idea generator of today's discussion. Let me now ask you, Agostin, to touch upon the key topics when you invited uh, Juliana and Georgi to take part in this discussion. Then we will <clears throat> listen to their presentations. And after that, we will have 30 to 40 minutes to discuss these issues together. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to our event. Building on last week's topic, we'd like to discuss the relationship of AI and ecology from a different perspective. We'd like to talk about uh, the impact of AI on uh, ecology. There are various reasons why we organized today's discussion. We had discussions about uh, our relationship to AI and uh, computing systems and IT systems. You can see that uh, people are discussing these notions and uh, topics, but uh, I think in education and in other facets of life, we should we are looking still looking forward to seeing an increasing number of discussions about the use of AI systems um, and their impact on ecology and nature. In uh, from a wider perspective, distributed interconnected systems and data centers give the notion of, to people that we, you can click on a link countless times, you can download content countless times and you can launch processes in the digital space which you can do of course but uh, there are systems behind these human actions and sis these systems are not really visible to the human eye or are hidden in the background so there's a major difference between pushing a button or uh, switching off the light using ai machine and in which case this um, AI system is communicated with a remote system and this generates CO2 and uses electricity and today given that these two topics are quite problematic today we need to talk about it during the pandemic we used um, video streams, we used um, Zoom and other platforms. And these systems have their own ecological plat um, footprint. And sometimes you tend to ignore this fact. I think Georgi will talk about uh, in her presentation that uh, she has, she's making research on people's behavior and uh, how we relate to voice assistants and downloading the same content several times instead of storing it on our own device. So there are a lot of 
human acts or actions that we tend to to not pay attention to enough and uh, so I'm, I'm planning to cover these topics today and let me now hand over to uh, the speakers to deliver the presentation uh, should i kick off uh, myself right on the first one cool i just share my screen um can you see my slide yes great okay um so um as you guys already mentioned, uh, thank you so much for having me today. It's, it's great to be here with you all. Um, I'm uh, Jordi Karik and I'm working as an innovation designer. So I guess the, the key driver of my work is addressing uh, the social and environmental inequities uh, in mostly in cities, but uh, in our society in general. And I use air pollution and climate change because I find them more, I guess, as Trojan horses to look at the different uh, uh, systemic uh, barriers to, to meaningful change, whether that's economic, political, social, behavioral. And uh, I, in 2014, when I started my PhD at the Royal College of Arts, um, I uh, looked at specifically uh, after working in New York with Long Island City residents who were severely impacted by air pollution in a specific community. And we worked uh, almost, uh, I guess, uh, months and months together. They had really perfect idea and data and sensor network around what the pollution was in the community, the severe health impacts on the community, and they were all on board of doing something about it. And even with all this engagement and community engagement, we still weren't able to meaningfully improve pollution in the community uh, for all sorts of economic and political reasons. But when I moved to London, I started observing working in different places, this sort of obsession and obviously very important air quality sensing and the deployment of different air quality sensing networks. Uh, but also this idea of how uh, currently or fact, I guess, the global air quality market is worth more than $20 billion. And this idea of how we have a lot of data around pollution and visualizations of pollution but how are we actually moving beyond monitoring air pollution to improving air quality and what are the steps that we need to make to enable that change and also through art and design because my work is always around systems change as well as individual behavioral change so looking at both aspects through either policy change infrastructural change institutional change also to individual behavioral change through the phd i wanted to have a more like I guess, uh, design, -led, uh, design led approach uh, where, where I look at agency uh, um, in technology design and by agency, I mean who, how any one of us has, have the power or agency to actually address the complex environmental uh, and social challenges we face in the 21st century in a meaningful way. And I guess my PhD was born out from this frustration of me as a person, me as a citizen, me as an employee, uh, and as a researcher and designer, what can I do to actually make any change when I know that how fossil fuel companies and how our systems are looking to lock ourselves, uh, us into different behaviors. And so looking at all the artwork and design work as well, it was all around this observation of pollution, revealing the problem, visualizing the problem, sonifying the program. So even as you can see on the bottom left is my own work. I became critical of my, my own approach of this, uh, this um, sort of passive observation of pollution. And I started asking the question, are these really the tools we want to design for people? And is this really the kind of right kind of citizenship that we want to, we want to promote? And there is this beautiful quote from Caroline Lucas, uh, who said, we will go down in history as the first species who was monitoring their own extinction um, oops. um and i looked at the tools that uh, we can engage uh, with i guess when we talk about pollution and while it is important for example to find a cleaner route when you're walking to to, to school or to your work to avoid pollution i also started asking the question is it really the best idea to encouraging people to actually turn their back onto pollution and not to face face the problem so again going back to this idea of is this the citizenship we want to to actually, I guess, promote through technology design? 
And this idea reminded me to the tokenistic approach of uh, Arnstein's letter of the uh, citizen participation, where we, it's a very silly example, but there is a developer who comes in a community and asks the community, oh, do you want the road to be blue or green? Instead of asking the question whether you wanted the road in the first place. So giving this kind of misleading narrative to people that they are participating in these decision-making processes. Um, and I guess observing some trends as an innovation designer and, op and opportunities for action, I looked at, uh, I guess, uh, demand side response. So that is really around how um, you mod modify or try to modify consumers' de demand for energy instead of the supply, supply side of, of the energy. And uh, I uh, conducted an interview through my PhD with Energy Saving Trust with an expert who explained that above 21 degrees Celsius, uh, I think, if you reduce your heating in the winter even with one degree Celsius, which is for an adult, whether that's 22, 23 degrees, the perception of warmth, it won't change much if you're not an older person. But that actually one degree Celsius would cut 10% of your emissions. And I was started thinking, well, 10% if you're only you're the only individual who does that doesn't it's a very futile action. But if you want have millions and millions of people who you send out a trigger and ask them all to change just a small amount could that have an aggregated impact at scale? And so I started thinking around this network, network element of, uh, of individual action and, and then look, looked at and analyzed many different human computer interactions and persuasive projects who all or often uh, focus on individual behavioral change rather than the collective, but also, I guess, a relation-centric design where people are not in individuals only, but actually they work um, in relations to others. And especially with social psychology, we know how your family and peers are impacting your own actions and attitudes uh, towards change. Uh, and also this idea of ambient intelligence and automation, that we need this automation in smart homes. And I started questioning whether actually we need more people who are aware instead of sort of as Sarah Darby explains in one of her articles, like infantilizing people through making life easier and comfortable to them without asking any questions whether this, this is good for us in the first place. Um, and so I tried to work with networks that already exist to, instead of only being critical of smart homes or being critical of uh, this reductionist approach to technology design, to really, really improve things that are already exist. Um, and then I found this stat around Alexas that are in 150 million homes and Google uh, Home or Google Assistant is downloading more than a billion devices. So I realized, okay, we have these millions and millions of devices in our more, most personal spaces. Can we actually design these technologies for with a more socially and environmentally minded purpose rather than just ordering pizza and, and, and use for consumption? And also I was interested in, with this current HCI approach around where we sonify or visualize the behavior while it's being performed so when the kettle is on it's sonified and singing your kettle of using and using your kettle or after a behavior when you for example get an energy bill a month later that you use your your electricity how we could maybe use these technology enablers to intervene before a behavior is even performed and create a pause in before an automated behavior happens and giving the right advice at the right time and the right place for people to, to become more conscious. And so again, what I mentioned about ambient intelligence to look at whether actually instead of using smart meters, we could create social companions that actually give people context of why their behavior matter and how their electricity, for example, connected to a power plant or heating or water use or transport or waste management and so on. And so first I started hacking the device itself, which was a very close system Alexa, and I won't play the video because it's too long. But basically I started developing with a friend of mine, Rebecca Jones, like this hardcore environmentalist persona for Alexa, where I gave uh, control to over all my appliances in my home 
uh, and when the grid, the energy grid was overloaded or there were too many users, it started dimming the lighting in, in my home. So I had some like guests over and the dinner table and the, the light started dimming. And then I talked and tried to convince Alexa and having a conversation, hey, can you switch the lights on? And because the, she was in a hardcore mode of hardcore environmentalist or dark environmentalist, she just started basically arguing with me. But then I realized this is like a very paternalistic kind of nudging approach of like, like your mom telling you what you should do. And it was like really difficult. So then I was also reminded of Ranulf Glenville, who was my supervisor at the PhD, that how design is a conversation about what to conserve and what to change and about what we value and what people might not want to change. And so I took a more of a carbon bank allowance kind of approach where I created this little device that was more of a social companion uh, for people to tell stories around different behaviors and why they matter and, and telling stories around climate change and the impact that they could achieve, but also all the systemic challenges that political leaders and infrastructural change we need to do. And to find out what they actually needed, I followed Daphina Fantini van Dietmar's PhD project where I became an AI myself or through a text-to-speech device and I became a companion so I got up every morning with participants who went for a run at 5 a.m so I was following for weeks uh, different participants to figure out like what they think about sustainability and what would be the most helpful for them to to the device to to say and tell and share and so in the end with a group of participants I set up the device within their home. We co-selected the behaviors with them, the topics that they were interested in learning about, uh, or the day-to-day -day engagement with them really helped me to iterate the, this, this, this sort of little system. And the trust issue was really interesting because the data was really just for there, for them to, to run the system of uh, CP, it's, uh, the storyteller device, the set of sensors that were measuring the different behaviors and switched on and triggered the sensor and the CP itself. And, um, and they trusted the device because we put it together. So they understood how it worked. It was really transparent. And I had uh, no overview of their data. It was really for them to, to understand and reflect on their own behavior. So it created trust immediately. Um, these are some of the sensors. And probably the un unexpected outcomes were and learnings is that because it was a voice user interface, the entire family heard the, the, the advice of the storyteller. So um, they started having conversations in the family of the stories they heard. They started reminding each other of what, the, what this little device or climate pie was telling them that morning. And because it was there for quite a few weeks, they actually developed an emotional connection with the device, which I obviously, um, from research ethics point of view was a very, as well, really interesting question. And they felt that it was really looking after them to improve their quality of life and to somehow created a shared goal uh, to, to have a better future. So that was a really interesting insight. And also how the errors in the system that I created. So one point at a dinner conversation, the device accidentally came on and started talking about beef and the re reduction of uh, red meat in their diet and so the entire family with the grandpa and everything is started talking about this so and that reminded me again to run off's point around how in communication our aim is always to reuse error but actually in design this this error may may become the source of novelty so I just really liked how many things I learned from these errors through the system and also this idea of pose so one of the participants explained that through conversations with their friends when they had these guests over it was really nice to have this pose but also sometimes when what happened is uh, for example every time they it is a very silly thing but every time they showered uh, the device came on after three minutes saying hey could you maybe uh, stop showering and what have you but after a month the behavior was get trained so I removed the device and they anticipated after three minutes, they, they gave, it gave them like a sense of time because after three minutes, they started hurrying up and they said like they anticipated and heard 
her voice in their head, even if when the device wasn't wasn't there. So it kind of trained this new sort of behavior. And with the last experiment, really, I used these devices to then network a few participants together. And here the participant chose different topics that they wanted to share with each other and discuss through Alexa. Again, I was hiding behind Alexa. Um, and they set different challenges each day for each other. And then we sort of measure the collective impact of, of their behavior. And one really interesting learning was that everyone needed advice uh, with very sort of complex decisions and trade-offs. So instead of these very silly apps where you look at like carbon footprint, they, they ask some really, really difficult questions. Some of them, which one question took me three weeks of research to even respond, which then reflects on the idea of how difficult for AIs to really give like a nuanced response. And one was around inequality when you actually increase the price of meat, what happens to communities and you know vulnerable communities who obviously now ha have access to accessible prices uh, to, to eat meat. Or for example, here, one of the participants said, well, I was trying to calculate, would it be more expensive to or more environmentally harmful to cook a pack of dried beans on a gas oven for two hours or to buy a, a canned bean that arrived from New Zealand with all the transport. So I ended up like, you know, spending weeks of like <laughs> looking at all the trains or trade-offs and calculations. And I think I stop here. Thank you. Nagyon köszönjük a, a színes bemutatást, és majd úgy is folytatjuk a kérdésekkel, hogy mi lett a... Thank you very much for this very colorful presentation, and we'll carry on with the questions at the Q&A session. Juliana, the floor is yours now. Thank you, and I start sharing my screen. Can you see it now? <laughs> Wait a second. The Zoom bar. <laughs> Again, so now, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and um, I try to introduce myself first. Um, so my background is uh, media education and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Magdeburg right now. And I worked as a research assistant in the last year and now I am focusing on my PhD and um, in my dissertation, I am dealing with the changing relation of uh, AI, art and aesthetics, and I'm doing it from an educational um, point of view. Um, so I assume that these new modes of production are causing new structures. You may have seen it in the last panel, maybe, uh, and in turn leading to new uh, ways of perception as well. Um, that sounds quite abstract. You might have an imagination <laughs> Uh, you, you could imagine it because you could have seen the last panel, um, but to illustrate this, I uh, also brought a few examples of Sophia Crespo, and uh, so she's dealing with a speculative, imaginative nature, so it also is referring to sustainability, kind of. <laughs> uh, so in her works, she displays, or in this work especially, it's, it's called Neuro Zoo. Um, she's displaying or playing with uh, nature and different ways to display and show nature. And you recognize or you see um, animals and bodies and different natural shapes, organic shapes. Um, but actually, the, all of these images display nothing. Um, so what we are recognizing as plants and animals and, and bodies are the results of statistical data analysis so these works kind of bring the algorithm to life and because the algorithm is not um yeah um not limited by physical or financial or creative constraints there are always more versions of the same artwork in a sense um so it's characterized by its unfinishedness and maybe this is also what we um yeah, kind of a symptom of the digital sphere, maybe this unfinished and processual procedural um, thing. And yeah, that reminds us of nature because we see the colors and shapes and everything around it. And it's, but it actually is not nature. And it, it just tries to simulate and extend the nature. 
in a way, in an artistic way. And this is, <laughs> that was my pretty short introduction. <laughs> um, if you have any questions concerning my research topic or in general, uh, then feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's a good balance uh, time-wise between the two presentations. Let me start with the same question that uh, surfaced at the end of the AI and art discussion. AI systems were taught or learned based on past data and they cannot predict things because they learned from our previous decisions and behavior. What do you think uh, when it comes to AI and ecology? To what extent do you agree with this statement? Or how can you, how can you do this in a way not to be conservative in predictions, but to come up with innovations if possible? Well, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> I mean, it's not my area of expertise, I guess, but um, I would say that I don't know, probably, um, I'm, I'm not directly answering your question, but I guess uh, in my case, what was really helpful is that I try to sort of, um, which is usually probably every innov innovator's uh, approach, just to putting an object that is used in certain ways into a very sort of different um, use, trying to apply to a very different sort of circumstance or, or challenge and see uh, through, I guess, design research, just to see what happens and how, how you can work with this existing system uh, and what you can, I guess, get out of it and how you push the boundaries of, of the system um, that someone created. Uh, and yeah, I don't know if that's helpful at all, but that was my approach on the PhD. Um, Egyébként én úgy, ami nekem elsőre eszembe jut, és What most gondolok itt a... Comes to my mind first, and let me refer back to what Jördi said, that error can be a source of novelty. I, I remember this quote. The, the interesting part in it is that uh, it, it's it's related to the critical attitude that er the, the people are uh, focusing on errors and uh, researching errors and when they identify them they, they can create new situations for the designer and the user and errors can help us um, uh, um, uh, put uh, systems from this uh, error focusing situation. Juliana used uh, some very interesting pictures, generative images that were created by neural uh, networks. And it tries to show how uh, an artificial system tries to simulate the forms and colors of nature. And what is interesting is that you can see the, these errors visually. So these are new types of images because they, they are newly created image architectures. So they, that's definitely a, a thought-provoking um, catalyst. So the errors, what are errors? see so to have someone as a designer or artist who actually notice the value of or recognizes the value of, of that error so with most errors it would it might be like oh this is so annoying i just move on to to kind of iron iron it out but actually looking at what that error was and what the value and the learning of that er from that error uh, can be i think it's it's super valuable so you need a person and an approach which kind of uh, appreciates those errors and recognize them, I guess. Um, I could also imagine that these errors and glitches and visual artifacts may show up different biases in data sets maybe. And I don't know exactly about this bias thing, but I could imagine that um, the, the bias that 
exists in the data will be re re reprodu <laughs> reproduced <laughs> um, by statistical data analysis. So um, if we build on data that is existing right now, then we will just reproduce the bias that ex is existing mm -hmm. right now as well. Yeah. So this pretty big challenge that we are facing right now. So I think some uh, What I think uh, is an intersection of your th of your areas of expertise that you mentioned: the database research, you know, visualizing database research, and uh, displaying it to the, the public audience. From if taken from a data visualization perspective, how different is that? How different is that uh, to, to visualize AI generated database or compared to a simple database or human generated database? Again, at a certain amount of complexitás lehet az ami I think mi sajátja ezeknek a Complexity is uh, in the very nature of these systems. That there we have this expression more than human. So it 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 brings about complexities that uh, cannot be absorbed by human thought. So we we have these systems that try to reduce this complexity or take out the complexity and transform it to into something that we can understand we as humans can understand a database can have various dimensions time data colors geographical locations there are there can be hundreds or thousands of dimensions and to to make to, to turn to transform them into two or three dimensions that is digestible to humans to make complex to simplify things visualization is a useful method to to help people understand that to, to have an idea of what these data are about there are a lot of things that are in that are invisible to the human eye and visualization can show a lot of um, phenomenon in the data but we cannot see the operations or um, processes behind the data for example these images the, the, that include uh, natural shapes and forms to, to teach that to computers you need a lot of computing time and you cannot when, when you look at that you cannot feel the, the weight uh, and cannot tell how much resource was used to create them. I think it's not only a question of uh, the data set, it's also a question of the algorithm itself. So we, I'm also I'm, well, again referring to the last panel um, where we were talking, where you were talking about the uh, black box thing and the um, uh, squid. <laughs> inside or coming outside the black box um, and it's like the algorithm um, and the data and um, together unfold its its uh, meaning performatively so it's always changing its shape and it's always changing its processes itself and so we it's hard and it's challenging to look inside and what's actually happened inside the algorithm and the output is probably the only thing that is graspable for the human to and perceivable for the human uh, to understand or to get in touch with these algorithmic processes and the data as well. So, I mean, I can tell you that there is a question which is um, on my mind now related to Georgia's presentation that what, what questions we should ask individuals uh, to help them make decisions and what uh, 
are the things that we should process for them to give them advice and what are the things that they they have to make the decision themselves so how, how uh, do you think we can set a balance in this regard to to make it uh, make the world more sustainable so how much we leave to the humans or how much we engage the human side and how much we use artificial intelligence moving even beyond that is like even if you have more a balance of a human who, who is that human so in in my case that was the biggest question that who who is the person who's writing the stories and generate the content right and whoever like should it be more democratic or like because obviously by me writing those stories i already shared all my own biases uh, about the world um and so in, in this way, uh, not only, I guess, the, the machine side, but also the, the human side of who, who has the ownership around sharing the information uh, is, is, is big, I think, a big question as well. I'm not sure. What do you think, Juliana? Um, <laughs> I was just thinking about that, that we use technology to control nature. And by doing so, we are harming the nature. And now we are using technology again <laughs> to control us that we don't harm nature. <laughs> so it's kind of a paradoxical paradox yeah. uh, relation uh, by the use of technology. And uh, Juliana, education is an important aspect for you. How, how much should be involved in education when uh, artificial intelligence, for example, or artificial intelligence tools or coding, uh, how much they should be considered as a basic competence for for people to be able to access to, to this kind of knowledge, or we should just leave it to, to experts and uh, we shouldn't uh, give it to, to laymen or ordinary people for such a knowledge. Um, I think concerning education and technology, there are two sides. On the one hand, there are um, there is a need for new technology that is used in educational context. The pandemic made it more than obvious that there are infrastructural challenges right away in Germany. I don't know, uh, how is it in Hungary? <laughs> is it as bad as in Germany? <laughs> I don't know. Um, on, this is the one hand. On the one hand, there are, yeah, there is the need for the technology. But on the other hand, there is a need for the concepts behind the use of technology. So it's not only about having technology that is probably outdated in one or two years, but it's also about uh, the right setting. And um, concerning the sustainability, it's not about um, on an, uh, uh, a medical thing. It's also about the structural thing. It's about... Um, in, sustainable in a sense that the material that you are uh, working on that is sustainable that you can adapt it and reuse it and use it for different contexts and not only buying a smart board and then buying a new smart board because it's outdated again um, but you were also talking about the competencies that are probably needed in the future and of course it's um, I, I think and I would argue that the data literacy is um, really needed that we gain, gain an awareness about what data are we um, feeding to the system and what data is used by the system, what personal data and what um, other data about our bodies when we are using fitness trackers and something, I don't know, what is um, used in cars about our driving behavior and whatever. Um, I think that Art is a good approach to gain these competencies, these this data literacy. There are also approaches by Catherine Dignazio um, that focus that are focusing on a creative approach um, to data by playing with data in an artsy and a playful way. Um, this could be one way to achieve data literacy or algorithmic literacy as well by creative coding, for example. Yeah. 
Also, there are other companies like Project by If that trying to actually raise awareness around like data and transparency and educate and kind of data lit literacy. So there are some ac actively um, many companies working on this side, not many maybe, but there are some. És György ilyen prezentációt kapcsán felmerült bennem azt, hogy ez... György, a new presentation, uh, these experiments that you uh, were talking about, uh, how much are they close to reality? Reality, are they going to be used or, or applied? When, when um, do you expect them to be part of our everyday life? Alexa, it was a very close system, and I guess that is on purpose. So, um, but there are some companies actually that are developing their own devices, and obviously, I'm not specifically interested in any of these devices. I was just using because they are a network of hundreds of millions of devices to piggyback on something that already exists, rather than creating more clutter. I guess to see um, how you know, different current, I guess, technology approaches could be improved. Uh, but I think we are pretty far away of, um, especially when I talked about all the nuances and complexities in terms of environmental change and inequities of how you address those to, for example, like a device like, like that, or whether a device like this can be helpful at all, or maybe not. So that's also a question. És Ágoston, te hogy látod, hogy a, a mű... And Ágoston, how do you think art could contribute to this dialogue in a smart home solution or, or from another perspective, how can it contribute to the dialogue about um, sustainable ecology? It, well, due to to the pandemic and the global virus situation, we had this media art festivals and events uh, focused on ecology, ecology issues, but they couldn't be held physically and they were organized as remote workshops. I also participated in some of them. And it was very interesting to, to see how the focus is changing, it's shifting. Uh, technology is not that interesting anymore as it was in the early 20s, uh, to early 2000s. Now it is more interesting how these scenarios can be used uh, more pur purposefully or responsibly. So how these processes can be used more responsibly. And it is often related to activism such art activities or installations are in, in public places, uh, using projectors and portable uh, devices, batteries um, enable us to take artwork to, to uh, outdoors, to, to make um, technology system independent of, of the studio or the theater, and a uh, flash mobs can be organized um, at sites in daily life. This is interesting that uh, the infrastructure is developing and it enables us to, to communicate in the different ways. And my, my own uh, activities, I, I experience that I use less and less cable because batteries are uh, improving. We have invisible networks connecting things together. Now we are in the age of IoT. It is like a basic competence for us um, in human activities that you can use wireless networks to transmit your data and your communication. And what makes this very interesting is that, that using them uh, has a large uh, carbon footprint and environmental impact batteries themselves um, seem to be more environmentally friendly. Um, it seems that using an electric car may seem to be more environmentally friendly, but if you add things up, uh, and it, I agree with Georgi in that, 
these are very complex issues. You can may have to do research for several weeks to answer such questions. Um, well, uh, you may have a car battery that uses too much lithium um, or so these, these questions, these problems are highly complex. And I believe that that artistic communication can help resolve them as well as analytics. It can also help resolve them. Uh, these systems are too complex to make them comprehensible uh, using simple tools. is that actually for example with evs we know that there are many different like economical and political narratives behind why we're supporting evs or where pollution actually comes from non-emissions and how they are you know with their tire wares are really like really contaminating like microplastic pollution in oceans so how that supporting evs is not simply oh let's be more sustainable there is a lot of narratives and and different um, interests and reasons why we support EV vehicle rollout, I guess. But also going back to the, your point around uh, activism, I think that's the best way to describe my entire project in a way that what I said about my own frustration of being a citizen is really, I think the value in the work that I was doing is more around um, the methodology of trying to every day question what's offered to me as a citizen and encouraging others to question what's offered to them and using whatever tools available for, in my case, it was Alexa to question, okay, how do Alexa work? What happens to my data? Can I hack the system? Can I use it for something that is more purposeful? Can I involve other people to actually enable some more meaningful outcome? And then the participants themselves said, oh, through the stories and the discussions, conversations that came from her or, or me, I guess, um, they reflected in a lot of issues that they haven't even thought of. And especially when the participants were working together, they, the social aspect and the learning aspect and observation aspect of element was really valuable. So I guess it's whatever tools we have is more, I guess, around that idea of how we, I guess, um, create meaning about the environment that surrounds us um, and the decisions we're making and the behaviors and how we imp impact our own environment, I guess, uh, rather than the technology itself, I guess. Juliana, Juliana something to add to, to conclude the discussion. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I was, I will, would totally agree with that, um, that uh, technology is guiding us or open up, is opening up new ways of exploring the world and also exploring technology itself, which is funny, <laughs> by the way, but AI could also help us to explore non-existing worlds, so worlds that are beyond or go beyond our own world and I think this is could be really helpful to be innovative in a way and to you know, figure out new concepts, new new way, ways of um, sustainable thinking, maybe as well. Yeah. Thank you for input. I think this is uh, a, a nice um, close can be a nice closing, and this is what we could put into forty five minutes. Thank you very much, Juliana. Georgi and Agoston for taking part in this panel discussion organized by the Goethe Institute. If you're interested in the other discussion uh, about art and AI, you can find that on the website of Goethe Institute. Thanks again, and thanks. Thank I want to thank you. Uh, audience.